Planets are not clones of the Earth. Yeah. Okay? And the other word that I would ban is Earth-like. <laughs> because these planets are not Earth-like in this sense. right? They may have some of those properties that are the same. They may have the same, roughly the same radius or the same size. They may have roughly the same mass. We do not have the information about their atmospheric compositions. And when we do, they're typically nothing like the Earth. The, we don't know if they have magnetic fields. We don't know what the conditions are on the surface. We don't know if they have plate tectonics and volcanism. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge laundry list of things that make the Earth the Earth. And so whenever people talk about Earth-like planets, my first response is there is one Earth-like planet, and you're on it. <laughs> there are lots of planets that have similar properties, and we call them terrestrial planets. You know, so Venus, for example, is quite similar to the Earth in terms of its size and its mass very much not Earth-like. None of us could live there. Um, Mars, again, is, is in some ways a, a similar terrestrial planet. It's much smaller. The, the mass is much lower. Um, so whenever you see stuff in the news about, oh, Happle planet discovered, just be aware that there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff being thrown at you that isn't necessarily backed up by facts. Yeah. And can I jump in there a little bit? Yeah. In terms of so these habitable, not completely impossible to be habitable planets. Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll just we'll go with that. Yeah. Um, we don't know a lot about them mm -hmm. right now. So that depends on how they were detected. So in general, what we know about them is how far they are from their star. And that's what gives us you know, whether they might have liquid water or not. Um, in some cases, we know how big they are. In some cases, we have a limit on their mass, and that depends on how we detected them. So the two primary ways to detect planets that have yielded tons of detections are radial velocity and transit. So Proxima Centauri b was detected via the radial velocity method, and this is actually looking at the very slight wobble of the star if you have a planet tugging on the star. So you kind of think of the planet going around the star, but the thing is the star is being tugged by the planet as well. So it orbits as well. And see, now I'm using hand gestures that are not going to work well on the podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so the, the star is also moving as the planet moves around it. It's being tugged on it. And now the center of the mass of the system is probably within the star, so that motion is quite small. But you can see that motion. And the way you can see that motion is by looking at the spectrum of the star. So if you disperse the light and make a rainbow out of the spectrum of the star, um, there are absorption features at given wavelengths. Those are due to atoms in the atmosphere of those stars that absorb, because of quantum mechanics, at very specific wavelengths. And when the star moves towards you, you expect those features to be blue shifted, right? So Doppler shifted, just like if you have an ambulance moving towards you and it moves to a higher frequency. As it moves away, they're red shifted. They move to a lower frequency. So you can see essentially a sinusoidal variation in these spectral lines and find a planet that way. And you know the, the period of that. So by Kepler's laws, that gives you the distance between your star and your planet. And you also know the, how big that tug is, at least in one um, direction. And that gives you a lower limit on the mass. Not the full mass, because you only see, if you're here and the star is here, you only see the movement of the star towards and away from you. So if, in fact, the star is moving a little up or a little below the plane, you're not going to see all of it. You're only going to see a component, so a lower limit on the mass. So distance and a lower limit on the mass. That's it from radial velocity. Um, now, you might have heard about the Trappist planets, so seven planets. Um, and of course, the press said, oh, new habitable planets. And they didn't say, new possibly um, hellish Venusian analogs. <laughs> and some of them probably are yep. hellish Venusian analogs. Um, <laughs> Or just incredibly hot and gassy. Unpleasant places of various types. Uh, these were detected by a different method, a method called transit. So in this case, again, hand gestures. Here's the star, here's the Earth. And if the planet pass, it happens to have the right geometry and passes right between us, it's going to dim the light of the star just a little bit as it passes in front. So again, this has a period. It happens every time the planet orbits the star. So we know the year of the planet. Again, we get the distance. So we know if it is in the habitable zone. And the other information you have from this is you know how much of the light is being blocked out by the planet. So if you know roughly how big the star is, which we know very well for stars of different uh, spectral types, you can, you can basically figure out how large the planet is on the sky, the size. Not the mass, just the size. 
So for transit, you have the distance and the size. And that's it. So most habitable zone planets we know of were detected by transit, handful by radial velocity. And we know just, we just do not know enough about them to know whether they are actually habitable or not. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're a miserable bunch, aren't we? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we're, here to, we're here to work detecting alien life. I'm not saying that yeah. don't even you know anything about the plants at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, habitable basically means that it could maybe have water on it. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. But, there are but we don't know. There are all sorts of things that could, even though you're in the habitable zone and you could take an earth and put it in the zone around you know, a low-mass star and you think, great, I'm actually in the zone. There are all sorts of things that can just screw that picture up. And it can be things like the fact that when you make the star lower in mass, um, the, the brightness of the star goes down and the, the temperature of, of the radiation that's coming out is down. And that means you have to go closer to the star to have uh, warm liquid water. And by getting closer to the star, then the star's own gravitational field starts to have a bigger effect on the surface and starts to twist on the planet's surface to the point where the planet is kind of locked tidally. So we see this around for the moon, around the Earth, that you see one side presented to us at all times. The same would be true for these planets, is that they would have a permanent day side and a permanent night side. And you can imagine that this is not great um, if you live on the night side, for example. Um, and then you're relying on basically the weather of that planet to kind of push all that lovely heat from the day side to the night side. And that presents its own challenges. And the other thing is that the low-mass stars, while they're not as bright, they're much more active. Um, and by active, we mean that the magnetic fields of these stars are quite complex things. And when the magnetic field tries to settle itself into a new configuration, what happens often is that a huge amount of energy is released from the star. And we call these flares. We see these flares on the sun. Uh, and we see what are called coronal mass ejections, when the flare actually starts removing chunks of material from the upper atmosphere of the sun and hurls it into space. And every so often, those flares, they get hurled into space. They come into contact with the, uh, the Earth's sort of region, the magnetic field that surrounds the Earth. That pushes on the Earth's magnetic field and squashes it back towards us. And we see it as a big outburst of um, the northern lights and the aurora borealis. So that's where that comes from. But when it gets really severe, what's happening is that huge amounts of very hazardous radiation is getting to the planetary surface. Now, there was an event around, uh, for the Earth around our sun uh, in about 1850, and it was referred to as the Carrington event. And it was a really powerful coronal mass ejection. We were unlucky that this thing ended up striking the Earth, effectively. Uh, and it was said that during that period, um, you could read your newspaper by night. That was how bright the aurora was. Now, the, the Trappist star was calculated to have a Carrington event once every two weeks. So you can imagine that if you're getting pelted with charged particles, very high energy um, particles of light, photons, all that stuff is smacking into your planetary surface, and you're an organism trying to survive on that surface, when we get hit by these things, it damages our DNA and causes mutations. It can be the cause of cancer. Generally speaking, it's not great to be living on these kinds of planets. So, you know, again, just to be totally depressing, it's another reason why um, a lot of these objects that we're seeing, we're seeing them around low mass stars, but we should be taking a step back and being careful and just saying, well, look, the conditions around these places are very different to the conditions that we see around what is mm -hmm. a very well behaved, rather placid G star. So, a star that's kind of in the middle of the mass range from the very low to the really massive stuff that, that Will tends to look at. Um, so you have all kinds of things to think about when it comes to making a habitable planet. Because habitable planets are this huge, complex system where the stuff that lives on it, like you and me, actually contributes to the whole system. It's an interlocking sequence of parts that includes the atmosphere, the rock, and the things that are there as well, the biosphere, the organisms. They change everything that's happening in the picture. And it's wildly complex, it's beautiful, it's fascinating, but it means that at a distance, when you only have you know, a silhouette on a star's disk or a, a measurement of what we think the minimum mass might be, that's just not enough information. Well, it doesn't help that we, right now we have a sample of one habitable planet. Yeah, that's even worse. <laughs> we don't really yeah. have a great sense of the range that's yeah. out there. Yeah. And certainly, you know, if there was a tightly locked habitable zone planet that had produced a civilization, they could be looking at us and saying... 
Yeah. There's well, no way there'd be life on that. That yeah. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It has di- a diurnal cycle, so you know you have you only have daylight half the time. You don't have a nice day yeah. side where you get all your sunlight. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'm just extrapolating here, but yeah. there yeah. is a bit of um, an anthropic bias. Yeah. We have. Yeah. <laughs> now there Absolutely. may be good reasons for that, yeah. uh, but we just don't know. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think you know one of the major steps forward, and this is more for the next twenty or thirty years, is if we can get light from these habitable zone planets and study the spectra of these planets, we can look for the signatures of life, like similar to what we find on our own planet. Mm-hmm. Now that is still tricky by itself because uh, when does it become an unambiguous? Now, yeah. certainly, if you have an alien civilization who says, hi, we're here, yeah. then it becomes un- unambig- unambiguous. Uh, but if you're just looking at the spectrum, there's, for instance, it's tricky because things that might be obvious biosignatures, like ozone, for instance, hmm. um, there are abiotic ways. There are ways outside of biology to pr- produce that. Mm-hmm. So it's still an open question of, if you're looking at another planet, if you're looking at the spectrum of another planet, what would you look for that would be an unambiguous sign of life? And yeah. um, I think this is going to be really tricky until we have maybe 30 or 40 spectra of planets yeah. mm-hmm. and yeah. this mass range in the habitable zone, and then we might have a good sense of what yeah. we should look for. So yeah. I think for every attempt at identifying a molecule in the atmosphere that's a biomarker, there is a, another paper published that says, no, it's not. Uh, and I can produce it without having any biology at all. All I need is a volcano, or I need the, you know, the correct star and the correct photochemistry for this to work. And I can come up with a complicated set of things that happens that produces oxygen or ozone or methane. Yeah. The one thing um, which I guess transmission is going to address, the, the most unambiguous way to determine if a planet has life is if it tells you it does, right? Yeah. By sending you a radio signal uh, or by having things in the atmosphere that you just don't make naturally. Uh, and so one of the suggestions for looking for, for life on other planets is to not look for any of the kind of naturally produced molecules, but to look for things that are artificially produced. And there was a point in our history, not very long ago, so say in the, in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, where we were providing quite definite proof that humans were on this planet. Um, <laughs> and that proof was in CFCs. So CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, are um, molecules that are not produced in nature. They're produced in factories. They have very specific industrial uses, and they harm the ozone layer, which is the reason that we don't have them anymore. We banned them. Mm -hmm. But there was a brief window where if you knew where to look and you had a good telescope, like a really good telescope, and you were able to look at the the spectrum of the Earth uh, in the same way that we're trying to look at the spectrum of other planets, you would see this sign of CFCs and go, yep, that is one dirty civilization living there. (laughs) And it would be unambiguous. Yeah. So really when you're saying that we are able to listen to space, you're saying that really we're looking at it and we're looking at different... We're just absolutely... That's what we're looking at. Like, unless you're studying... Um, like black holes or something where you're really looking at gravitational waves. I suppose it gets into how we talk about looking, but for what we're talking about here is generally Mm -hmm. visible light or light which is just sort of into the area our eye stops looking so they're near infrared. Um, But but the way we might listen more Mm -hmm. in the conventional sense that we'd think of listening is looking for radio waves, Mm -hmm. which is still actually looking at space because it's still light, but it's more what we'd imagine as listening. Mm. And that's when you're looking for artificial signals, their transmission of... Radio 4 or whatever it might be, which you might manage to accidentally pick up. Um, but the, the, the way astronomy at the moment is doing things... Well, OK, we get into SETI questions, but the way professional astronomers are doing things at the moment is looking in the sense of using light, which is similar to other stuff we use with our eyes. Studying the electromagnetic spectra. Yes. Yeah. Through various mm-hmm. means that... Well, I don't know, would, would looking at spectra consider... You know, like, when we think looking, we think of just images, and we do more than just looking at images. Mm, yeah. But... Yeah. <laughs> Okay. But I think the area where an, ambi- an ambiguous signal might, you know, I think where yeah. the transmission is thinking more about is maybe you pick mm. up some yeah. radio signal, I w- um, which yeah. is a different area. Yeah, so there's a difference, I think, between uh, discovering uh, life and discovering intelligent life. Yeah. Yeah. And, of course, that opens us up to all sorts of different uh, questions about what we mean by intelligence. So essentially, something that he said is uh, sort of artificially created. Uh, it's a signal that has not occurred from a natural process. It has yeah. been generated by another form of life intentionally yeah. um, with the express purpose, perhaps, of maybe communicating mm. something, some yeah. kind of information. Yeah, yeah. I would love yeah. to hear a little bit more about that. Like, if we're looking at, at 
are listening specifically for broadcasted signals or unambiguous life signals.